a, a piece of advice that Fred gave me many years ago. I think it was at the 2008 uh, AHA International Humanist and Ethical Union SSA joint conference. Uh, was that uh, it's very worthwhile to get uh, perspectives from outside the United States. And our next speaker, uh, Leo Igwe, uh, is going to provide us with exactly those kinds of perspectives. Um, and he's going to talk about the need for a global approach to secular student activism. Uh, Leo uh, has uh, been a human rights advocate uh, in, uh, in Nigeria and in Africa, um, I guess Western and uh, Southern Africa, uh, for many years. Uh, he's been specializing in campaign against uh, child witchcraft uh, accusations and has seen the uh, really uh, horrendous damage that that can do to, to families and to children. Uh, and um, he's actually uh, faced um, assault and uh, robbery and all sorts of other horrible things for speaking up about this. Uh, right now, uh, he's in Germany uh, working on a PhD uh, on this topic. Um, and uh, he is uh, a research fellow at the James Randi Educational Foundation, uh, where he continues his work against uh, superstition and all of its pernicious and horrible effects. Uh, please join me in welcoming Leo to the stage. Thank you, August, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, friends, for inviting me to speak at this event. I feel honored to be part of the biggest gathering of secular students in America and I think in the world. I'm currently doing uh, a research program at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. So I understand how demanding it can be for students to organize non-academic programs on campuses. So I salute you all for your time, efforts, leadership, and commitment in promoting secular values. When I was in Nigeria, and leading the Nigerian Humanist Movement, I was in touch with the Secular Students Alliance. I corresponded with the Executive Director, August Brunsman, and the campus organizer, Liz Lindell. We received some organizational materials which helped us to set up groups, secular student groups, on campuses where none existed before. So I want to use this opportunity to thank the Secular Students Alliance for supporting campus programs beyond the borders of America. In fact, the Secular Students Alliance has already adopted a global approach. But why do we need to do more? Friends, the future of secularism in America will be shaped not only by what takes place in Washington or at the House of Congress, but also what happens in our schools, colleges, and universities. The project of a secular America will be determined not only by what politicians do, the bills they sponsor, the laws they pass, or the rulings at the Supreme or District Courts, but also by what students do. For some reasons, our national humanist and free thought groups tend to invest so much energy and resources lobbying the politicians in Washington and getting them to uphold secular values. But they tend to forget one thing, that the seeds of the damage they are trying to rectify at the House of Congress, many of those seeds we are sown on the campuses. And that if we are to win the battle for a secular America in Washington, we have to win the battle for a secular America in our classrooms and lecture halls. 
So campuses are a major front in the campaign for the separation of church and state. So we need to support secular student groups. We need to ensure that the Secular Students Alliance continues to grow from strength to strength and its influence from campus to campus. Yeah, when I was coming from the airport, uh, that was uh, yesterday, so uh, I was discussing with Joe, and uh, he told me about, um, about the situation and how things are going at the Secular Students Alliance. I think we got to a point, he told me that the budget of uh, a branch of the Methodist Church here in, uh, in Ohio, that they have, the budget is more than that of the Secular Students Alliance. There's a national group. So, and we, we have to fix that. Yes, we have to fix it because, because if we really have to have influence, so much influence, you know, throughout the country, we cannot use a budget, a very small budget, you know, that is smaller than that of a, a branch of a church here to do that. So if our influence has to grow, our budget has to grow. So again, we, we cannot have a secular America with schools, colleges, and universities where education and indoctrination mix, where creationism is taught in science classes, where there is no wall separating teaching and preaching, where classrooms and extensions of churches, classrooms are extensions of churches, mosques, temples, or where the values of reason, science, and critical thinking are treated with disdain. Friends, secularism on campus and secularism off campus are intertwined, are interconnected. Also, a secular America cannot exist in isolation. We cannot strictly have a country where there is a world separating church, mosque, and state in a world where such separation is vehemently and violently opposed. This is because the world is changing rapidly. Human beings are getting more interconnected in ways we could not have imagined a few decades ago. What happens in one country shapes issues and events in other countries. News travel at a great speed. This conference is being followed not only by those of us who are present in this hall, but also via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so many online facilities, by secular students from Oslo to Cape Town, from Kabul to Istanbul, from Tokyo to Abuja, Sydney to Seoul. Secularism has gone global. So we need to re-strategize. We need to reposition the secular students movement to respond to the challenges facing students in the contemporary world. Why do we need to do that? Many students and young people find themselves in countries where they cannot think freely, where they cannot ask questions or express their views without fear. Fear of being molested, fear of being imprisoned, fear of being attacked. These students, these secular students, they need a voice. And the Secular Students Alliance can be that voice. In some parts of the world, it is not permissible for students to meet the way we are meeting here today. In fact, many students live in countries where a secular gathering like this could end them a jail sentence or attacks by fanatics. These students need a group they can connect with, at least virtually. And the Secular Students Alliance can be that group. Now, think about the case of Malala, who was almost killed by the Taliban for campaigning for girls' education in Pakistan. Think about the case of over 200 schoolgirls kidnapped by Boko Haram from, from their dormitories in Nigeria. These girls were abducted in the course of their quest for education and knowledge by those who believe that girls are better 
as sex slaves than being educated. Students live in countries where, students live in some countries where they can be imprisoned for posting messages like God does not exist or Allah is a sky God or any message that is critical of Islam or religion in general on their Facebook pages. Many students live in societies where they cannot socialize or relate with any person of their choice. In societies where they cannot renounce Islam, as in the case of Sudan, or they cannot convert from Christianity to religion, sorry, from Christianity to, to Islam or from Islam to Christianity, they cannot renounce their religion. In Nigeria, we have had cases like that. In Jordan, we have had cases like that. So students in countries with strong secular tradition have a moral duty and obligation to keep alive hopes and promises for students in other countries like Iran, Nigeria, Sudan, Afghanistan, Indonesia, Mauritania, where secularism does not mention its name. And friends, this is not only in the interest of the secular students' movement, but also in the general interest of America and the world. Those who attacked America on September 11 were not just terrorists. They were products of religious indoctrinating centers, product of anti-secular and illiberal madrasa school system. They were motivated by extremist ideologies and nihilistic sentiments, by dogma, blind faith, fanatical hatred, absolute truth, inculcated in them in the name of education and religious upbringing. Let's take, for example, the Islamic group that is waging a jihadist campaign in Nigeria. It is called Boko Haram, meaning Western education, whatever that means. Western education is forbidden. The group has attacked Western-style schools, killed and kidnapped students and teachers, construction and health workers. The group embodies a strand of Islam that is pervasive in many Muslim communities, an ideology that is opposed to secular education, secular schools, secular state, secular thought, and yes, secular values. Friends, terrorism is both a military and ideological warfare. And in fact, terrorism is more of an ideological warfare because terrorists and jihadists are motivated by a set of ideas. They are campaigning to enthrone their own idea of society by force. Terrorism starts in the mind and is nurtured in our schools and in other learning centers where minds are shaped. So if we have to defeat groups like Boko Haram Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, and other Islamic groups that are threatening the world, a military solution is not enough. Yes, we have to defeat them militarily, but more importantly, we have to defeat them ideologically. And the Secular Students Alliance, you are our best hope of eradicating religious extremism in America, you are our best hope of rooting out Islamic militancy in the world. Friends, the lynch mob attacking and killing alleged witches in many parts of Africa, Asia, and Oceania are products of faith-based education and instruction in schools and in families. They are products of magical and mystical thinking that is so entrenched on campuses in these parts of the world. I guess for many people in the U.S., here in the U.S., and in other parts of the Western world, which hunting is a thing of the past. Sadly, this is not the case. Those who engage in occult business today may not say that they are expelling witches. They say they are casting away demons. 
or evil spirits, or that they are performing exorcism. As you may have heard, Pope Francis recently has shown us that he is not as modern as many people may think. He recently recognized an international association of exorcists. And I call that an international association of witch hunters. The recognition of exorcism by the Pope is an endorsement of witch hunting because witch hunting is a form of exorcism and the, the Vatican should be roundly condemned for sanctifying this abusive process. So, witch craze is re-emerging in different forms with force and ferocity, partly due to the failures in our school system. And we must confront it, we must fight it. We must try and nip it in the board. And the best place to wage this battle against witch hunting or exorcism is in our schools. And the best way to fight it is by promoting secular thinking and values. So today, we need a robust global secular student activist program to counter the ideologies that foster extremism and superstition. We need a proactive secular student movement driven by the force of logic, critical thinking, and free inquiry, not the force of arms, to confront the wave of Christian, Islamic, Hindu, Buddhist, animist, and other shades of religious militancy raging in the world. We need to counter the currents of dark age, the currents of dark age and religious radicalization on campuses in America and around the globe by adopting a global approach to secular student activism. Friends, I'm aware that the challenges are enormous and the Secular Students Alliance cannot confront them alone. It cannot meet all these demands without the support of like-minded individuals and groups in other parts of the world. And I want to assure you today that as the Secular Students Alliance embarks on addressing the global needs of secular students, you have in me a staunch, a staunch friend and ally. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I want to say that they're not, they're not really distant the way you think. If you notice, um, they say that there are some UK citizens or something going to fight in Europe. Some people go from UK to Syria or something to fight. Um, I don't know whether they're, they're tracking how many move from here, maybe to such places. And I guess that when they did the the war in Afghanistan, I think there are some American citizens all I think, fighting on the other side. So, I don't think that it might be as distant as we think. Because many of these places, um, people are very poor. So money can be a, a lot of inducing. A lot of people. So sometimes, the money, the money doesn't come from there. The money comes from here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, this is my guess. I am not an expert, I'm not a researcher, but I live in these communities. So sometimes, I can... I can, I can say this from my own experience. But track it, the money sometimes comes from, it doesn't come from there. The arms, they don't come from there. We don't have arm factory in, in, in Nigeria. Somewhere the arms come somewhere. 
from the arms from countries where they have the arm factories or who ship arms to those places. So that's why I'm saying that we are underplaying it in a way that really is not helping in tracking the problem. That's that's number one. Number two, what can you do? Internet, internet has been a lot that has been useful, even for us out there. So sometimes the articles you post, sometimes the issues you raise, the discussions you have, you inspire a lot of people. A lot of people follow what goes on here. Yeah. So you can inspire a lot of people by either trying to blog on some of these issues and uh, also trying to bring perspectives from different parts of the world. Because you see a lot of people following what, what goes on on websites of organizations here and what else actually goes on you know, in their own societies. So bringing those issues, making them topical issues, discussing them, bringing different perspectives, raising the awareness, you know, can also help inspire people and encourage them. Yeah, I'll, I'll dissuade them if they are, maybe if they are trying to do something criminal. Yeah. Uh, you uh, touched upon a little bit about the blasphemy laws um, in some of these countries. Um, my question is, like, how do we, uh, what's the best way for us to, for, for like-minded people in those countries to spread our ideas without being um, subjected to these laws for sharing these ideas. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what I can call the best. <laughs> so what I what I can what I can just say here now is that maybe what are some other ideas, you know, yeah. could, you know, um, or ways then which people can adopt <laughs> which might be useful. When, you, when, when one is dealing with a fanatic, I, it's difficult to know what best could really, could one use to really stop a person from acting in a horrible way. But I, like I said, internet, something on the internet, sometimes you might not know whom to track. Yes. I, I think that when we discuss it, when, you, when we make it an issue, when we, when we, um, uh, when we try to integrate it in our programs, like sharing experiences of what is going on. Like in Nigeria, we have this case of um, um, a guy of around 29 years um, who left Islam and, um, and the parents said he had some mental problem. So they took him to a mental hospital. Yeah. So what did he do? He sent out a message, I think, um, uh, via the Twitter or something, because he had a Twitter account. So we were able to rally support and campaign and put pressure on the government and, uh, and eventually he's out of the hospital. So it's risky, yes. But we can always find a way to support them by raising the awareness that this is what is going on. Like what happened in Sudan? I think that if not the, the, that there was some international pressure, maybe you know the, the, the story would have been different. So, Raising, it, raising awareness, international awareness around it, without necessarily maybe attacking, you know, the government in question, I think sometimes it helps. Um, I'm actually covering right now a story that's happening in Belize about LGBTQ rights there. Um, and apparently the large, uh, like the opposition against LGBTQ people in Belize is largely funded by a pastor in Arizona. So it's American religious money that is going into a different country to try and indoctrinate these people to think a certain way. Um, so I, I very much love what you're talking about because I see it constantly when it's even just US religious money, which is something we can actually do about um, here in the States. But just as a, a add on to that and like a question, um, how, in your experience, how often do you see Christian missionaries who are able to access um, people and especially young people in definitely those regions of Africa in the, and even some in the Middle East. And why is it that, in your opinion, that they are better organized at doing so than we are? Well, I think that is, this is a question we are going to raise at the <laughs> <Right>. workshop level. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but I must say, uh, and this is probably what, one of the issues we are going to discuss at the Foundation Beyond Belief Conference, you know, 
I think we have to, first of all, say yes, we have done poorly in this area. First of all, we have to admit that. Yes. We, have, we must acknowledge it. Then we now ask ourselves why and how. Then we brainstorm and come up with ideas. But unless we have acknowledged, but you know, sometimes there's this arrogance that, yeah, yeah, we're there, secularists, new atheists, yes, we're there. Where are we? Yes. Fred Edwards, I acknowledge, I was inspired by your speech. I know that we have made progress, but I think we still have a long way to go. <laughs> we still have a long way to go. Comparatively, we have made some progress. Yes, I agree with you. But we still have a long way to go. What the, 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 the point raised now is that we need to get more organized. Yes, and we need to stop fighting over levels. Yes, I like what August was saying about whatever level you want to get onto. Yes, they get organized, they get focused. And sometimes we need to, like you said, you know, internationalize our scheme. Sometimes we have groups, we look at only our own state, you know, as it concerns our state or something like that. So we, we need to come up with international programs. So that is how those missionaries, those missionaries are not there. Some people sent them, some people are supporting them. So we need to get, it may not be everybody, yes. Some people might be working in America on American-based issues. Some people might be interested, like you said, in, in Belize or something. Yes. And there will be people here to support the person to do the work. I know that if we come up with those programs, there will be people who will volunteer. Pathfinder sent around, I think, four people to, uh, to Ghana, and they did wonderful jobs. And having that cross-cultural, intercultural experience is very important because the idea of cultural atomism, everybody on his own, is gone. So the earlier we think ahead and strategize, the better for our movement. I don't know how to do it. Okay, from here then, the next question. Okay. It seems to me that over the course of history, religions either get less extreme, you know, they, they, they become more moderate, or they get more extreme, you know, they, become, they become more dangerous. An example would be, Christianity. I mean, a thousand years ago, Christianity was during the Spanish Inquisition. You know, torturing and murdering thousands of people at a time, you know. But now we have, you know, much more modern Christianity, especially in the U.S. You know, I think Christianity has come a long way, but then a thousand years ago at the same time, Islam, for example, you talk about Islam, was a lot more moderate. It was, it was more, there was a lot more reason, a lot less, there was less violence with Islam. But now, today, it has, be, it has become more extreme. My question for you is, how can you have Christianity from becoming any more extreme than it already is. How can we encourage Christians to stay moderate or become more moderate, you know? Starting with what we have today, with the, with the amount of moderateness we have with Christians, especially in America, how can we keep American Christians moderate? Yeah, I'm not a tough question again. <laughs> now, you see, I, I have issues sometimes when we try to glorify the past. Yes, I have issues. And I want to tell you, I don't want to return to the past, no matter how glorified it is. Um, I agree, yes. Uh, Islam, maybe, they, they talk about the Arab enlightenment, which, you know, yes, yes the scholars and all that. Yeah, but how much information do we have, really? Are we just going to focus on that, just aspect alone? Yeah, just like when we also talk about the Black Ages, and we also have some Christian scholars you know, Windows area, you know, we came up and published a lot of works. And maybe there was a lot of documentation of what was going on, maybe in terms of witch hunting and other dark age practices. Friends, I must tell you here, maybe, I don't know, but the kind of Islam we inherited in Nigeria and many parts of Africa, their, their, their history in the past was bad. It's not something, it's not, it's not something to write home about. We had a jihad in the 18, in the 19th century. Yeah, maybe that, that might not be part of that might not be maybe so many centuries ago. But I mean, I think that it was a kind of genocide. Yes. But those people, they were celebrated. They were treated as heroes. The person who, the person who led that jihad is called Sheikh Uthman Dan Fodi. He's treated as a hero today in Nigeria. He's a criminal. Yes, by today's standards. Some of those people we look at, they were heroes then. They should be in jail in their life today. 
So there is still nothing. I'm still not convinced about that fact. Because we don't have enough history. We don't have as much information as we have today on some of those things. How do we stop it? I think that promoting secular values, critical thinking, I don't, I don't think there's any other way to do it. I know. But religious claims, they need to be subjected to scrutiny. Number one, who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the Quran? Somebody will tell you, oh yeah, Allah dictated the Quran. How? Wow. Thank you. And you dare not ask this question. When are we going to ask it? They didn't ask it. That time, they were having a lot of scholars. They didn't ask the question. If you ask it, they will cut off your head. That time we're talking about. And that's still doing it today. When are we going to ask this question? Who wrote the Quran? Who oh, it was dictated to an illiterate, an illiterate, all of, all of a sudden started writing. Writing what? And you, and you don't. They still keep people when you, if you tear a piece of Quran, in Nigeria, a woman used a piece of Quran unknowingly as a toilet tissue, toilet tissue, they cut off the head of her husband. And paraded it on the streets. Today. And that time we are talking about if they did it, what would happen to the person? Are you sure they won't, do, they won't have done worse? They will wipe out the whole family? I'm not sure. That's why I said I am skeptical when it comes to the. I cannot give them that credit. After all, I wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, someone can help me. Okay, there, okay. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned how some in the part of Africa face not only persecution, but in the face of some country, even arrest for renouncing their religious faith. Uh, if I may inquire, what have what have people like you done to create safe zones for such people? And are there any take-home lessons that we can add from that that we can use even in places where we may, they may not face such more than, I guess I want to call, what, what do I want to call it? Uh, I guess maybe Oscars is being ostracized by the members of their community. Yeah, um, there's very little right now we can do. Yes, in terms of craziness, because craziness is space, because I must tell you, <laughs> it's difficult to get a safe space. Let me give you an example. Um, the, the, what I talked about now happened, I think that one happened, that was in 1994, 95. The wife of a Christian, you know, used um, a piece of Quran, unknowingly, as kind of toilet tissue, and somebody found it. So when they came, they mobilized. Uh, some local, their Islamic students, they all mobilized, and um, and uh, the police came and took the man away, kept him in custody. So in the night, they went to the police station, overpowered the police, and took the man away, and beheaded him. Okay. So that's the police, the state machinery. I don't have it. I don't have any police. Yes, I don't have. I don't have an army. I don't have. I can't, I can't have such. So you also have to. You need the state to to run maybe a safe space. So so that is difficult. So what we do is, is we try to use that opportunity to generate debates. That's what we do, because. We are always told in Nigeria that oh yeah, Christianity is yeah, this Islam is means peace, you know, but violence is what is going on. So so we try to use that opportunity to generate debates. Like now the one that happened, we've been I've been writing a lot of blogs and we've been trying to raise the awareness that really, you know, the brand of Islam we have in Nigeria is against not just only the, the believer, it's against everybody. And we try to generate debates. But the little we can do, like now, I have been working with IHEU to raise awareness about raise awareness on the case of the guy, you know, who was taken to a mental hospital. So we brought him out. He's out of the hospital now, and we are supporting him. He's staying with one of our colleagues, and we're trying to decide whether it's still safe for him to stay in Nigeria or we have to take him out. But for us to do that, it requires a lot, a lot of resources. We don't have as individuals. 
So what we do each time is that we do what we can. So he's right now he's stayed safe somewhere, trying to figure out what to do. And uh, then while we explore whether we can get a university in the US or somewhere that could maybe give him a position, then from there he can now you know continue with his life. So we are doing what we can. Okay, I'll move this way, please. Eh? I'll move back. <laughs> I'll move this way. Almost, I think I have still have some. Let's go to that. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Where? Okay. Okay. okay, then. Sorry. Um, yeah, then you. Okay. Yeah, you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, are there no more like uh, moderate religious groups out there who are willing to, to listen to what you guys have to say, or maybe like the the people who work in the mental hospital or the teachers in the schools? Uh, is there anybody you might consider an ally? It's difficult. Yes. There are people, individuals, who are moderates. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are very um, angry. They are, they are not happy with what is happening. Mm -hmm. But you dare not op come out openly to register your anger because you will be seen as anti. Because, you know, these guys, they reason in two ways, you know. Their brain is just the truth. Either you are for them or you are against them. So immediately you criticize, it means that you are, you are, you are against them. Okay? So then the so-called moderates, that's the challenge we are having. The so-called moderates will be somewhere at the middle. They will just be here. You know? So they don't want to be seen this way. Definitely they are not with them. Yes. So that is a challenge. And whenever there is a, contro a controversial issue this way, it's difficult to get allies because that is the time to really come out with a definite position. So, but from the background, you could know that you have supporters. But those supporters cannot be visible in terms of coming to identify with the person. The, the, the guy I'm talking about now is staying with one of our colleagues. Because though people might want to support him, but they may not want him <laughs> to be in their house or in their apartment. Yeah. So it is, it is difficult, but I know that there are allies there. But hopefully, Maybe the situation can get to a situ can get to a point where our allies will really come out when we need them. Yes, they are here, but it's difficult for them to come out openly to identify with us. That's a challenge. Okay, um, is the U.S. really the the linchpin country? Is there other countries that have been um, helping you in terms of or like communities of country like the UN or? You know, peacekeepers that have been trying to help you, international yeah. organizations, because the U.S. is pretty... Yeah, 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 of course. Everybody talks about the U.S., everybody looks up to the U.S. Everybody. Well, they're kind of two steps behind. Yeah. Right, yes. now, right now, it's good if they're not doing, <laughs> making any trouble. Mm, well, I think that the U.S. is doing something. Let me give you examples. Like in Ghana, they, they, have, uh, they came up with a funding to do some research in terms okay. of witchcraft accusation in Ghana. Yeah, though I criticized that because they said that they were, they were, the, the, the goal, the ultimate goal was to close down the witch camps, which I, I don't like. I never liked that. And I pointed that in my, in my comments or article or reaction to, to that. So, and when I visited one of the camps, I think that the embassy officials came around. But I know what they're doing. They don't want to be seen to be coming out to say witchcraft is superstition is nonsense, you guys should stop all this, and they will be accused of imperialism and create of neocolonialism and all that. So they, they they are negotiating their way in their head, so trying to help the people along the line they really want to go. That's what they're doing. But that is not helping us. It is still postponing what do you call it? Is it the what do you call it? The danger of what? It's still you know perpetrating it. So it's helping. Uh, but again, you know there's this Western, anti-Western feelings. So sometimes, <coughs> America plays a part, they don't, they, want, they don't want to be seen to be against Islam. So when also things like that happen, like now, I was in touch with the American embassy in Nigeria over this, this guy. But you know, they also don't want to come out to say, yes, people who are in court, who are against Islam or who denounce <coughs> Islam, we support them. So, so I think that they are playing some politics too. Yeah. So, but individuals and groups, I don't know yet. But I think so far this is the much you know we have gotten. But I know a lot could be going on I'm not aware of. Yes. Then the UN. I 
am I'm really worried about the UN. Yes. Because the UN staff I met, they're interested in keeping their jobs and doing their work. Yes. And uh, some, of, some of them, at least I have met, are witchcraft believers. Yes. I met one working for UNICEF in uh, Malawi, and she was telling me about witch plants. Yes. You may not have had that, and I don't want to bother you with that story. So it's funny. So, witchcraft plants. Eh? So, he, she was a star. I think she's still, maybe. She's on the staff of the, of, of the UN in Malawi. And I, and I said, come on, what are you doing there? So some of them are witchcraft believers. So what, what do you expect them to do? Yeah. So that is the challenge we are having in Africa is that many people whom you expect to be allies, maybe because of the organization they work for, believe in those things. They are homophobic, they are superstitious, occultic. Sometimes some of them think that they have to use some juju and chance to keep their jobs at the UN. And you want the person to come and fight that thing? No, they don't. So that's a dilemma. That's a, that is a challenge we're having for now. Yeah. So how can we, as mostly American students, advocate for secularism in places like Malawi or Ghana without being associated with neocolonialism? Because I mean, it's a very real thing, and it's not necessarily something that we want to be associated with, but we do want to help people outside of our borders. How can we get, you know, you know, create safe spaces, get people on the ground, and help people in countries which are yeah. very much wrong with fundamentalist beliefs without looking like we're just trying to further the American empire, which is what it looks like to a lot of people. I think that if we continue to listen to, I don't know how to, is it detractors? How do you say it? People who are not in support of what you're doing. You won't do anything. For so many years, people were telling me, oh, they are using you. When they use you, they will dump you. I said, use me for what? <laughs> for what? You are using me to fight a problem that is affecting my own community? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, as you see, there is some thinking. When you look at it, you ignore it. Yes. So, so they have told me all sorts of things. I don't care. I don't care. That's the word. I don't care. So that if we continue, if we say, oh, because they will accuse us of racism, then you don't go and tell people, look, these witchcraft narratives are informed by fantasies. Are you really convinced of that? If we are convinced, if we are driven by the conviction, if we think that the cause of reason is not just good for America, but good for the world, I think that we should not allow those who want to accuse us of racism or neocolonialism to stop us. Period. So also, people say, oh, I'm a kind of Western puppet or thing. You know, they, say, they, they call me all sorts of things. I don't care. If you reason, they say you are Western. I say, what does Western mean? What does it mean? So you get, it's not only you that you get some, you know, get called names. We also get called names. Yeah. But what drives us? Is it the name calling? Or the conviction? The passion? For what we believe in, I think one should take precedence. That's their passion and our commitment to reason. So as long as we are doing that, people will always find a way to come around. Come around at a point. But we should not wait for them to come around before we get things done. Otherwise, we will be, we'll be, we'll be you know, postponing you know, the whole thing. The solution to the problem. There was some hands at the back. OK, yeah. One of my coworkers just got back from a Christian missionary trip in Uganda. And he said that there he found a lot of people who are very fascinated to learn more about Christianity and who seemed to be in awe of him. Um, what kind of things, like he said it was more interesting to, uh, I mean, it was easier to promote Christianity there than here in the United States. So I wondered if you had some ideas what kind of things might be driving the interest in Christianity over there. Well, I also, you see, there are some reports you get. If, I don't think there's any missionary that will come back from Africa that will tell you I was well received or something. <laughs> yeah, have you gotten a report like that? Why don't you ask questions? Why? And sometimes, why not go, not with an agenda or agenda or whatever, just go there freely and look around. 
and ask yourself, are these people really Christian? Or are they just presenting the Christian desires, the Christian image for a purpose? Christianity was imposed on Africans, and it's still being imposed with money and scholarship. Yes, Islam was imposed. What Nigeria is wrestling with now is they're wrestling with two really imposed religions. They don't even know what to do. They're killing themselves. Islam and Christianity in Africa, they have, okay, okay, they were, okay, they were, they, they received Christianity, right? But they still believe in witchcraft. Go and read about child sacrifice in Uganda. Go and read about other harmful traditional practices, female genital mutilations. Beliefs that are incompatible with Christianity are still thriving. So what does well receive? What does that mean? That's my question. I mean, you come here, I mean, you come here, the, the colonial legacy is that Many people in Africa look up to white people. So when you come, a lot of people will come around because they know you come with money or you come with scholarship. Go there if you don't come with those things and come back and tell me they receive you well. For what? <laughs> <laughs> and that is what you have That's a CNN, that, the American CNN. You, get it? you are coming from American CNN. Oh, yeah. You have it. Okay, when you do those things, they come around you, they flock around you. Not everybody. Now, when they flock around you, then you, you give them what you have. Christianity, okay. Christianity is that thing a white man brings, and when you go to him, he gives you money and scholarship. <coughs> I was in the seminary for several years. Some of my colleagues are studying here, free of charge. Yeah. So why would they receive? Uh, why would they receive Christianity nicely? Why to give them scholarship? So I question that. So and. Uh, I think that there is more to the way religion and Christianity is practiced in Africa than sometimes reported, because they need that report to get to go back or to get more funding for what they're doing. So question those reports. Okay, I think uh, maybe it should be the last because I've seen our friend move around. So whenever I see him move around, I know that my time will soon be up. <laughs> okay. So you obviously called us like the Alliance to become stronger supporter of international uh, policy. So my question is, what other organizations uh, do you see work already doing good, secular organizations already do doing good work uh, in Africa and the Middle East? Uh, I know there's like Dr. Young Porter and yeah. similar groups like that. What, do you, what would you recommend? Is it in terms of organizations they can work with? And just doing the most good. As in, as in, in, in terms of work? And in terms of, uh, of helping communities there. So the general welfare, things. I guess. Of course, there are so many groups, you know, working with. I don't have access to the information on what they are doing. Okay, yeah, but I'm particularly interested, of course, in the secular approach because I know that, um, like we're going to discuss at the Foundation uh, uh, Beyond Belief Conference, charity is a strategy for conversion. Like the nice Christianity from Uganda. The news, the report on nice Christianity from Uganda. What they use is that they use charity, humanitarian service, to attract people. Um, my father asked him why he converted from the local traditional religion to Catholicism. He told me that that was the only way of getting education. Period. So not because he's, he's convinced of Jesus Christ and all this, all this talk about religion and all that. And that is why Africans, yes, can tell them, yes, they are overly religious but covertly non-religious. Go right inside them. Yes, I grew up there. Because religion came with a lot of power. <laughs> yes, it's a tool for domination. And many people found themselves in weak positions. So what you do is to align with the power. They, they, they call it the domino effect or whatever. You, you hold on to it. That's why some parts are uh, Islamic, you know, and they remain Islamic. Like in Sudan, you don't convert. Are they really Muslims? Are they really convinced of, the, of that religion? No. They are there because of social pressure. Yes. And we need to find a way to engage them, provide information for them, and make people to understand that there is no true freedom. If you can't freely believe and freely change your belief, freely question your belief. And, th and that's a challenge now to many, many, many people in, uh, on the continent because of the pressure from this dominant mainstream religion and because of their money. 
you know, Saudi, they are funding the money, they are pushing the petrol, the money they get from petrol. Iran is building schools in, 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 in northern Ghana. They are building hijab schools. And of course, Vatican is pushing the money also. So money and religion that all coming together. And because of poverty in Africa, you see many people, you know, responding, going towards this. Not because they are convinced, not because they are converted, but because of poverty, because of lack of opportunity. So, and we should approach with a lot of skepticism reports that make us to understand that really these people are religious or they are Christians or Muslims. 